joining us for the COPD Patient Forum. Uh, the British Columbia Lung Foundation is really excited and really honored that so many of you are joining us uh, both online uh, and watching this recording, which will be available to you on our website at bclung.ca. Uh, it is really fantastic. We're honored that so many of you trust us with this information. And I know uh, that you are going to learn so much from our fabulous speakers that we have today. I also want to first start off by acknowledging that we are coming to you from the unceded uh, territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. And I hope all of you take a minute now to uh, acknowledge uh, the land that you're on and how lucky we are to have that. Uh, for us to do things like this, which is so important. Now, of course, like I mentioned earlier, we have four amazing speakers uh, for you today, and all of which are going to help us not only age well, uh, but breathe easier. So I'm really excited uh, to introduce our first speaker of the day. It's Dr. Tharwat Farah. Uh, Dr. Tharwat Farah completed his internal medicine and respiratory medicine training at the University of British Columbia's Respiratory Division. He completed two years of postdoctoral fellowship in the respiratory medicine um, faculty, and Dr. Farah brings a vast amount of experience in both clinical practice and clinical research. Dr. Farah has been participating over the last 20 years in clinical research for evaluation of the efficacy and safety of new treatments in asthma and COPD. Dr. Farah has led a distinguished career serving as the head of medicine and director of the ICU at Mount St. Joseph's Hospital and he is the president of the medical staff. He is currently a clinical professor at the University of British Columbia's Respiratory Division. Dr. Fair provides expert advice on respiratory and pulmonary function testing, as well as sleep apnea evaluations. In addition to serving communities in the Lower Mainland, he has been serving as a respiratory consultant to the Northern Health remote areas for the past 30 years. And a fun fact, he also speaks Greek and Arabic but I'm hopeful that he's going to do this presentation in English. Uh, Dr. Farah. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I hope you guys are, can see my slides uh, clearly. So this is my conflict of interest, which is essentially uh, related to the fact that, uh, as in my introduction, that I do uh, studies as well as uh, research and uh, presentation to different companies. But uh, my talk, hopefully, it's not very biased at all, and it's more focused on helping patients with COBD. Uh, now, uh, about a quarter of a million uh, COBD exacerbation usually occurred per year, even a little bit more than that. Uh, overall, about 800,000 Canadians are diagnosed with COBD, but we know uh, that uh, the disease is underdiagnosed, and there are uh, another eight hundred thousand Canadians with um, uh, undiagnosed COPD, and unfortunately, we need to uh, encourage them to have the diagnosis done. Uh, uh, COPD is the leading cause of death, and it is considered the fourth leading cause of death, but it is expected to be the third leading cause of death soon. And uh, uh, the COPD is associated with high admission to the hospital when there is an exacerbation. So from this slide, I would recommend or suggest uh, that if you have any patient uh, who is a friend or a relative or uh, who has symptoms of ongoing respiratory symptoms of cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, uh, recurrent chest infection, or are a smoker or ex-smoker or are exposed to uh, respiratory irritants, you should encourage them to go to their family doctor and get tested for COPD because this is why we are not capturing the people who are suffering from COPD but not diagnosed. So essentially, anyone who smokes or ex-smoker or exposure to respiratory irritants whom you know and you feel that they are more short of breath, they have respiratory symptoms of chest infection and a current cold, they should get spirometry. In order to uh, uh, look at uh, 
the COVD. The COVD is actually considered the most leading cause of admission to the hospital. Uh, and the second admission also, they are considered to be the leading cause. And compared to all other uh, diagnoses, so COVD is number one in terms of admission to the hospital. If you look at the cost of uh, COVD, and this is from year 2000 to year 2010, uh, you can see that uh, this cost actually is almost 5,400 per patient. Now this cost has almost doubled in the last 10 years. And the point I wanted to make sure that you are aware of is that about over half of the cost is when the patient gets admitted to the hospital. So although uh, the duration in the hospital is like seven to 10 days when they get admitted, but the cost in hospital admission is very, very significant and it eats up most of the money allocated for patients with COVD. And if you look at the community care for COVD, the cost is only about 5%. And so if we can really decrease the in-hospital treatment and prevent exacerbation from happening and uh, try to treat the patient in the community with, you know, non-pharmacological uh, medication, uh, non-pharmacological measures, you can actually save a lot of money in patient to, with COVD. So this is very, very important slides, and I wanted you to pay attention to it, and I want you to consider having this at home. The way we evaluated, the way we evaluate patients with COPD is we look at two things. Uh, and the first one is the questionnaire of CAT score, which is uh, eight different questions. And each question, you can answer by zero when there is nothing, or by five when it is really significant. For example, I never had cough, you can put zero, or if you have cough all the time, you could put five. And at the end of the day, you can calculate all your answers, which are eight of them, and you can have a score. Now, you can have this in your uh, uh in your house as a paperwork or as a, in your computer or on your lab, on your iPhone. And essentially you can do it once a week, twice a week, uh, once every day if you have symptoms. And it gives you a really accurate measurement of how your COPD is responding to treatment. If your score is less than 10, then your COVD is adequately managed. As you go higher than 10, it becomes uncontrolled. And if you go over 30, it's significant and you may need to be seen in the emergency or in hospital. It's very easy to do. It is very accurate. It is very easy to communicate this information to your family doctor or to your specialist. So if you call me, for example, and you say that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ferrer, my CAT score went from 10 last week to 20 uh, or 25, then I know that you need something to be done to help you right away. So it's eight questions, scoring from zero to five. You calculate them. You are targeting the CAT score to be less than 10. Anything above 10, you need evaluation. That's number one. Number two is that the exercise tolerance you can do, which is called MRC listening scale, which is Medical Research Council scale. And it goes from zero to four. And you can also have this available at home. And you say, okay, well, in October, my MRC distance scale was one. So I was really only short of breath when hanging up on the level. But now I'm having difficulty walking 100 meter uh, on flat ground. So my uh, MRC distance scale went to three. 
so you need treatment. So as COPD patient educated to manage their disease, you have to have these two tools available at you, to you at home on your computer, on paperwork, or on your laptop. And you can do them once a week, once every two weeks, based on your symptoms. And you can communicate this with your family physician or your uh, respirologist when you see the patient. So you can have the, your CAT score, you can have the MRC distance scale. So, and based on that, you can go from no problem or significant problem based on your MRC distance scale. Now, the most important thing we as physician and you as a patient is to prevent exacerbation because exacerbation is bad. It's bad for COVD. And what's exacerbation? Uh, there are three types of exacerbation. One exacerbation is called mild exacerbation when you have minimal symptoms, but nothing has been ordered to you and nothing has been initiated for treatment. Uh, moderate exacerbation in when you have symptoms of cough and spirit and production or chest tightness or shortness of breath, and you will need to be on antibiotics or prednisone and your action plan will be initiated. Severe exacerbation is when it is significant to the point that you will have to go to the emergency and you may be treated in emergency or admitted to the hospital. So exacerbation is very bad for patients with COPD and we need to prevent it at any cost, especially severe exacerbation. We call exacerbation or, or lung attack or flare up of COPD. Why is exacerbation bad for patients with COPD? This slide shows you clearly that if you follow patients with COPD, which in this case was 200 patients, over four years with recurrent exacerbation and hospitalization, you actually lose up to 50% of this patient within four years. So if you have, if in my practice, I had 200 patients with COPD and they keep exacerbating, admitting to the hospital, within four years, I will have only 100. 100 will be dead. And exacerbation is very important to prevent at any cost because also it affects the quality of life of the patient. So here, for example, I'll explain to you this a little bit more. This is the ratio of the time from the exacerbation and the value of the FEV1. The FEV1 is the amount of air you blow out in one second, and it measures obstruction. So if you have a value of FEV1 and say a liter and a half, and you get an exacerbation, right away you, this value goes down and it goes down significantly and it takes up to eight weeks to recover. So the point I wanted to make is that not only there is high risk of mortality in patients with COPD, but there is also high risk of morbidity in patients with COPD who gets hospitalized because the recovery of their lung function is very, very slow. And they will, some of them, they may never go back to their baseline. So another point of why we should prevent exacerbation from happening, first is the high mortality associated with it, two is the high morbidity associated with exacerbation. Very interesting point, with exacerbation, you may have problems, not only with the lung, but with the heart, with the brain. For example, here, after exacerbation, in the first 10 days following exacerbation, you have very high risk of cardiovascular heart attack, up to two times more with a heart attack after 10 days of exacerbation. You have 40% increased risk of stroke and this has continue all the year uh, as we go along. So my point is not only that you have problems with the lungs, 
but you also have problems with the heart, you have also problems with the brain. So you are at two fold increase in myocardial infarction after uh, the exacerbation and at 40% risk of having stroke after exacerbation. And in, in general, this is because that every single exacerbation happened, there is a significant airway inflammation, increased uh, trafficking of neutrophils to the lung, uh, release of uh, mediators, release of uh, toxic toxins, which may affect actually the cerebral circulation, the coronary circulation, and leading to stroke and myocardial infarction. So our objectives or goal of management uh, of patients with COVID is uh, these seven things. We need to reduce the mortality. We need to prevent the disease progression, improve their health status, improve their exercise tolerance, relieve them from symptoms, and above all, the prevention of exacerbation from happening at any cost. So, so if you were to choose one thing is prevention of exacerbation, then relief of the patient's symptoms, improve their exercise tolerance, and of course, prevention of disease progression. Now, over the years, there has been number of inhalers created to prevent and help us to achieve these goals. And uh, most of you have seen some of these inhalers. So you have the short acting beta agonist, the long acting beta agonist, the long acting anticholinergic, the long acting, uh, the short acting beta uh, anticholinergic, and then whole bunch of inhaled steroids, a lot of them, and then combination of ICS lava, completion of ICS lava again, extended all the way until here, and then lava lama, and then at the end, the triple therapy of lava lama ICS. So we went actually in the 50s or 60s, we were treating patients mostly with short acting beta agonists, and now we are looking at treating the patient with triple therapy based on the indication, of course, of the medication. So COBD management, as about six, seven years ago, people started really questioning the excessive use of ICS in patients with COBD. And this study is from uh, Spain, looking at how much ICS inhaled corticosteroids were given to patients with COPD, which is not really indicated. And this is very mild COPD, which is gold stage one. And this is mild to moderate COPD, gold stage two. And in gold stage two and gold stage one, one third of the patient used ICS, gold stage two, two almost half of the patient used ICS. And the point I wanted to make is that few years ago, we were all giving inhaled corticosteroids to these patients. We were making them actually sicker, and we were overusing a drug which is not indicated in patients with COPD. And because of this, there has been very internationally recognized clinical trials uh, over 25 thousands of patients were enrolled in MPEC trial, ethos trial, coronavirus trial, full field trial. These are clinical trials which were conducted by pharma and essentially looking at what are the best treatment for patients with severe COVID who are symptomatic or have exacerbation. Is there any role for inhaled corticosteroids in patients with COPD? how could we prevent exacerbation from happening? And this is the most updated guideline 2023 from the Canadian Thoracic Society guideline. And I will make it very simple for you. 
if you have you have three different options. Option number one, you have a patient who has very mild COBD, good lung function, CAT score less than 10, MRC distance scale less than about one, low symptoms burden. You no longer need to treat this patient with anything except long-acting anticholinergic or long-acting beta agonist, either LAMA or LABA. However, group number two is that a patient who has a little bit of mild symptoms, higher symptoms, so CAT score of 10, MRC distance scale of two, and now the lung function is a little bit less than 80%, you have to treat them with LABA, LAMA, and if they not respond, LABA, LAMA, ICS. Now, the, if, however, you have a patient who have high risk of exacerbation, because I showed you that the exacerbation is associated with high mortality, high morbidity, high cardiovascular, high cerebrovascular events, you need to be more aggressive in treating this patient quickly, and we will recommend using LABA, LAMA, ICS because it reduces mortality. If the patient is still symptomatic, you may use uh, macroloids or phosphodiesterase receptor blocker or mucolytics. Now, you can see from the guideline that it is clearly there is no rule, no place for inhaled corticosteroids. So uh, there's no point of having a patient with COPD who is high CAT score, high MIC distance scale, and I'm giving them Flovent and Ventolin. That does not go according to the Canadian guideline. You could, you have got to make sure that you follow the guideline and prevent them from excessive use of inhaled corticosteroids, which predispose them to uh, complication. Now, once you get exacerbation and you are in the hospital, you end up having problems. Why? After the exacerbation, you end up having ongoing mucus production due to inflammation, uh, uh, viral infection, bacterial infection. The mucociliary clearance is impaired. You lead to airway obstruction, reduce expiratory flow rate and respiratory muscle weakness. So you get a patient who's, who had an exacerbation, got admitted, he's leaving the hospital or he's still in the hospital, and he still have ongoing symptoms due to all this excessive mucus production and decreased elimination of the mucus. More mucus, difficult to clear the mucus. More mucus because of inflammation, decreased mucus elimination because of reduced ciliary clearance and reduced expiratory flow rate. So uh, because of that, uh, we tend to think how to manage patients with COBD by looking at it this way. Non-pharmacological and pharmacological. The non-pharmacological is as important as pharmacological. The pharmacological management of COBD is following the Canadian the Canadian consensus guideline of managing patients based on their MRC CAT score history of exacerbation. And it is primarily focused on using bronchodilator initially, then triple therapy if there is exacerbation. This data was approved and indicate and sort of scrutinized very clearly. And these four trials I explained to you are the landmark trials which led to the change in the guideline. When it comes to non-pharmacological, it is as important as pharmacological. And the non-pharmacological, the most important one, in my opinion, 
is, of course, vaccination and smoking cessation. Uh, because the time allowed to me is not very uh, long to talk about smoking sensation, but I just wanted to make sure that you are aware that there are a way of nicotine replacement therapy, uh, smoking cessation clinics, which you can refer the patient uh, to get, take advantage of that. And they can actually get nicotine replacement therapy for free for three months per year through BC uh, Pharma. But vaccination is very important. And we are in the renaissance of vaccination these days. So we have up-to-date pneumovax. You don't have the flu shot, which is up-to-date, COVID. But the third one, which is really, uh, the fourth one, which is really important now is RSV. RSV is respiratory syncytial viral vaccine is important for patient with who are old and has an underlying comorbid illness. And we need to make sure that this vaccination is done appropriately. So this is the RSV vaccine, and it shows that there are two, dif two different fusion protein. It is an RNA single-stranded, and if you get the vaccine, you can block this protein, and as a result, you can improve the outcome if you get infection. This study shows you, for example, that if you have an RSV vaccine, it prevents you from it prevents the patient from dying. And you can see quite clearly that in elderly people, up to 85% who has RSV uh, represent the whole mortality of RSV infection. The children, they may get infected, they go to the hospital, but they recover, they go home. But elderly people, when they get infected, they end up having higher mortality. And this is a very important slide because many times, as I will show you, you get patient with exacerbation of COPD, they come to the hospital, there's no sputum production, uh, they end up being hospitalized and treated in hospital, and we don't know the cause of the exacerbation. It could be environmental cause, it could be a viral cause. And as we go along now, we know that RSV can cause up to 11.4% of hospitalization of COPD. So a very big portion of hospitalization is related to uh, viral infection, part of it is vaccination with RSV. So the first point I wanted to make in non-pharmacological treatment of COVD is vaccination. And you have a spectrum of vaccines which are all indicated <clears throat> in patients with COVD. And the new Kid on the block is the RSV vaccine. And I wanted to show you three things that this vaccine is effective, it's given only once, and it can prevent exacerbation from COPD, and it is safe except for the minimal side effect of local reaction. Other vaccines, of course, you know all about it, you have had it and your doctors have talked to you about it before. Smoking cessation is very important, as I spoke about. The third most important non-pharmacological measures you should encourage yourself and your friends who have COVID to do is exercise. You have got to keep as active as possible, either by walking, and if it is raining, you can go to shopping malls and walk in the shopping malls, or you can have a treadmill at home, or you can have a bike at home. But active isometric exercise or aerobic exercise are very important because 
you do not want to lose muscle mass, you do not want to become uh, to, to gain weight, you do not want to become dependent on a walker or elevators or somebody to take you from one stop to the other by car. So you need to keep exercising. And then the other issue which always comes is oxygen. I'm going to tell you that if you qualify for oxygen and you have very advanced COPD, the government will pay for you. And you have to show that you have hypoxemia at rest, low oxygen level at rest, less than 90%, or PO2 less than 55 or PO2 less than 60 in the presence of other comorbid illness. But if you have COPD and your oxygen situation is 92% and you walk a little bit and then it goes down to 89 or 88, providing you with oxygen, it does not really make a big difference. So don't get alarmed about that. Only if you have resting hypoxemia, uh, or if you are planning to travel high altitude, you should use oxygen. Now, the, the other options you need to consider is after getting a flare up and exacerbation, you end up getting excessive amount of mucus secretion, impaction, more exacerbation, and you need to get rid of the mucus because the longer the mucus stays in your lung, the more likely you will have another exacerbation. And this uh, study, this uh, slide here is a CT scan uh, of a patient with COVD underlying bronchiectasis. And you can see quite clearly, this is the airways. You can see the airways uh, very, very dilated. This is a bronchiectasis patient with underlying COVD. And this dilated bronchi are full of mucus. And you get difficulty to get rid of the mucus and you need to do something about it. So one way of doing it to get rid of the mucus is giving um, a liquid called n cysteine or mucumist. Uh, the second thing is to give some hypertonic saline and help them to get rid of the mucus. The third thing which is uh, available now is aerobica. And aerobica is actually is a, a oscillating positive expiratory pressure device, and it uses it reduces exacerbation, it improves the lung function, it improves the ventilation, and improves quality of life. I think it's about a hundred something dollars, uh, and uh, it, it it will last you almost the whole year uh, if you clean it and keep it keep it up and uh, now this can be used either alone or with a gadget where you can put hypertonic saline to clear the mucus so as i told you uh, aerobica reduces uh, the length of hospital stay by 24 percent it reduces the exacerbation by 28 percent it it improved the lung function by about 200 ml uh, and it improved the quality of life, which are the questionnaires for gut score and SGRQ, which are standard question to see how the patient feel about the disease. So again, aerobica reduces excess length of stay in the hospital, reduces exacerbation, reduce, improve the lung function, improve the quality of life. And above all, it improve the ventilation on the lung. So this is before the use where there are areas which is totally wasted because it is blood going to it, but no oxygen. And then once you use the aerobica, you get rid of the mucus now oxygen or air is going and blood is going and you have no more ventilation, perfusion, mismatch. 
Uh, the way you do it is you put it with your lip tight, you inhale and hold for two to three seconds, you exhale slowly and steadily, and then you repeat and you cough. And of course, you can use it with also an access to the drug. And you can clean it with soap or water or by uh, disinfection, which I'm sure that it will come in the discussion. The last two slides is that the most important thing uh, is to make sure that the delivery of the medication is accurate and sufficient. So if you use any device which is an MDI, I would strongly recommend that you use an air chamber. These are pediatric air chamber, these are adult air chamber, because with the air chamber, you can actually control the, 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 the inhaler, the deposit, the position of the drug, and minimize the side effect. So in summary, uh, COPD exacerbation is prevalent, very significant. I talked to you about why it is important to prevent exacerbation from happening. I spoke to you about the risk of exacerbation and the cost associated and the mortality and morbidity and the high risk of cardiovascular and cerebral complication. And then we talked about pharmacological and non-pharmacological. The pharmacological is clearly outlined in the Canadian consensus guideline and in no longer a place for inhaled corticosteroids alone and short acting beta agonists. And the non pharmacological, it has five components. Of course, smoking cessation. I strongly recommend exercise regularly. I strongly recommend vaccination up to date. I shared with you the new vaccine for RSV. I strongly recommend chest fissure and getting rid of the mucus by using aerobica. And delivery of the medication is very important, especially in view of patient who has uh, difficulty coordination. So I'll stop there and uh, hopefully, I did not take too much time. Thank you, Dr. Para. That was an, an incredibly insightful presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I There were a number of questions that came up. Uh, if there are questions in the audience right now, feel free to drop them in that question and answer link that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we'll try to go through as many of them as we can. We don't have a lot of time right now, and I promise you some of the questions that are in here, we will get to those uh, in some of our presentations that you're going to hear shortly here coming up. Uh, but Dr. Farah, I, I did want to touch on the topic of RSV because you did bring it up, a uh, very timely discussion around what it is. Uh, just for the sake of the audience, could you give us a little more context? What is RSV uh, and how does that really connect with what we're talking about today with COPD? Uh, is it a comorbidity? Uh, how does it really affect people, particularly during uh, respiratory season? Yeah, so for a long time for patients, for doctors like myself who looked after patients in ICU and in the hospital, we will get patients who have an exacerbation or flare up of their COPD and we don't know the cause and we cultured everything and nothing is done, but we were not really culturing the RSV virus or any other viruses. But after COVID, we start really uh, cult uh, culturing the virus and we found out that the RSV is a common contributing factor to COPD exacerbation. So RSV uh, affects elderly people, affects people with comorbid illness, uh, especially COPD and especially patients with heart failure. This virus is very notorious for the fact that it actually affects the mucosa of the airways and slops the mucosa and leads to airway obstruction and leads to the patient to get into acute respiratory failure. In elderly people, there is no treatment apart from just giving them mechanical ventilation and prednisone. But 
uh, supporting them until they get over it. So the most important thing is to prevent the vaccine from uh, to prevent the disease from happening by vaccinating them. This vaccine now is available. It is approved in Canada. It is given one once only. You don't need to do it every year, at least for now. And it is given with an adjuvant. You get you get the vaccine and you get the adjuvant at the same time. And it can be given with a flu shot all uh, by itself. It gives you a protection of about 95% from lower respiratory tract infection. And it is a disease which we do not have treatment, so it's very important to prevent from happening. That's perfect. And, and just following up on that too, Dr. Farah, um, there are many people in, in this call and otherwise that want to know, well, how do I go about getting that vaccine now? So this vaccine, unfortunately, up to now, it has not been approved uh, by PharmaCare. So you have to pay out of your pocket or if you have a third party insurance. It costs about $230 and it can be given uh, by pharmacist without a prescription, but most likely the family doctor will prescribe it for you and you get it through the pharmacy. The reason you get a, you need a prescription is probably because you may claim it later on as a, from your third party insurance, but it's available on all the pharmacists. That's good. Uh, it sounds like organizations like ours, the BC Lung Foundation, have some advocacy work in making sure that uh, out-of-pocket cost isn't there for uh, things like this. Yeah, they, they, they say that it's anticipating like next year or so it will be covered similar to a flu shot or something. Very good news. Uh, the other thing that I want to put out there is that uh, the CAT test that you had mentioned earlier is available online. Uh, we will drop that link in the chat for those of you who missed it, and we'll make sure that gets sent out with information. Uh, there are a number of other questions, but I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll move on uh, to our other pre presenters, and we'll probably have similar questions come up. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Farah, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is Ms. Sonia Bola. Sonia, a friend of our organization, I still owe you a cup of coffee, so we will go do that, Sonia. Uh, Sonia is a respiratory therapist, a certified respiratory educator, and a certified tobacco educator. Sonia graduated in 2015 from Thompson Rivers University as a respiratory therapist, and she began working in the hospital in acute care. After two years of acute care, she, she decided to try out the community, and she fell in love. She worked at the Community Respiratory Services in Fraser Health for two years before starting her position at Vancouver General Hospital. Sonia currently works at VGH in the Lung Center as the Asthma and COPD Education Coordinator. Sonia. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, so I would like to recognize that I work on the shared traditional homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, I have received some disclosures. I've received speaking fees from these companies um, for presentations on inhalers. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pharmacological treatment of COPD and the non-pharmacological treatment of COPD. So Dr. Farah showed a poster earlier and I have a poster to share as well. Um, so these are all the COPD inhalers that are currently approved on the market. There are a lot of them. Um, so I wanna break it down for you guys. Um, I wanna break it down into the different categories um, and the different types of medications that are out there for COPD. So let's start off over here on the left. So there are short acting bronchodilators. There are SAMAs, which are short-acting muscarinic antagonists, and SABAs, which are short-acting beta-2 agonists. Um, the most commonly prescribed short-acting bronchodilators that we see are Ventolin and Atrovent. Um, sorry, Dr. Farah, can you, can you mute? Um, yeah, so these are the two most commonly uh, short-acting bronchodilators, and they're both used as relievers, typically, in COPD. Then there are long-acting bronchodilators, 
there's combination inhalers that have bronchodilators in them. And then there's even some inhalers that have two different types of bronchodilators and an inhaled corticosteroid. So bronchodilators, what are bronchodilators? Bronchodilators open up the airways, um, the bronchi and bronchioles by relaxing the smooth muscle that surrounds the airways. So if we look over here um, to this, oh, to this picture on the right, we can see um, this airway over here on the right that's a little bit more narrow. Um, there's these tight muscles that are squeezing the airway compared to normal. Um, so bronchodilators, they open up the airways and they allow air to move in and out of the airway more freely. There's less trapped air. Um, these bronchodilators reduce the short, uh, symptoms of shortness of breath they open up the airways, they reduce air from being trapped in the lung, they reduce hyperinflation, and they reduce exacerbation or flare-up risks. There's two types of bronchodilators. There's beta-2 agonists and muscarinic antagonists. So beta-2 agonists are fast-acting rescue medication. They allow the airways to open up by relaxing that smooth muscle, the short acting ones are effective within five minutes and they peak at about 15 minutes. They remain effective for up to four to six hours and they're available in a nebulizer format. So these are some of the short acting beta agonists here on the right that are available on the market. For long acting beta agonists, LABAs, these are typically in combination with other long acting bronchodilators or with an inhaled corticosteroid. They can be used on its own, but it's not really commonly seen. So there's only one on the market and that is separate right over here on the right. LABAs, they're effective in about 10 to 20 minutes and then they can last 12 or 24 hours. This one lasts about 12 hours. Um, so muscarinic antagonists. They're short acting muscarinic antagonists called SAMAs. Um, they inhibit smooth muscle contraction. They're effective within 15 to 30 minutes, and then they stay effective for six hours. They can be used regularly or as needed, and then they're also available in a nebulizer format. So there's only one on the market, and that's right over here um, in Canada. And then there's also long-acting muscarinic antagonists, so LAMAs. These are long-acting ones. These prevent the smooth muscles from getting tight. Um, they reduce breathlessness, disability, exacerbation, and they improve quality of life. They work in about 30 minutes and then they stay effective for 12 or 24 hours. So these are all the llamas that are out on the market right now. Then there's combination bronchodilators. So there's inhalers that have two different types of bronchodilators in them. We have one short acting one, and then we have a few different long acting combination bronchodilators that are out on the market. And then there's inhaled corticosteroids. So inhaled corticosteroids, ICS, they reduce inflammation of the bronchi and bronchioles. They have to be taken regularly in prescribed doses for COPD. Once you start an ICS, um, the effectiveness peaks in about two to three weeks. In COPD, inhaled corticosteroids can be used um, or only used in combination with bronchodilators. You must rinse, gargle, and spit after use. So here are a few of the inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting bronchodilator combinations out on the market for COPD specifically. There are a few more out there for asthma, but these are the ones that are out there for COPD. And then we have two inhalers here at the bottom, which um, have two bronchodilators and an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and there's two of them out on the market. So now I just wanna go over the current guidelines. So there's a COPD CTS guideline. Um, this was updated in September, 2023. So it's really new and recent. Um, we'll start over here at the left. So if a person has mild COPD, also where they have low symptoms, so their CAT score is low, it's less than 10, um, their MMRC, so it's like a shortness of breath scale. So MMRC of one would be, you only really get short of breath when you're hurrying or walking up a hill. 
And if your lung function is good, where your FEV1 is over 80% of predicted, then you'd be in that mild category and have low symptoms. So we recommend starting off with a bronchodilator, just one bronchodilator, either a LAMA or a LABA. If um, you have moderate or severe COPD, where your symptoms are a bit higher, um, you get short of breath, a um, little bit more than, than just hurrying up a hill or, um, um, or more than hurrying or walking up a hill. Or if your lung function is less than 80%, then you would be in one of these two categories. If you have a low risk of COPD exacerbations, then um, you'd follow this yellow category where you would start off with a dual bronchodilator. So an inhaler that has both bronchodilators in them. And then if you're still in having COPD symptoms, then we can step you up to a LAMA LABA ICS. So two bronchodilators and an inhaled corticosteroid. If you're high risk for um, COPD exacerbations, like say you've had one in the last year where you needed prednisone, or if you've been to the hospital for COPD, then you'd be high risk for another COPD exacerbation. We recommend starting off with triple therapy. So having two bronchodilators and an inhaled corticosteroid from there, if you're symptomatic, then adding on um, a medication, um, a tablet for COPD. Um, there's a couple of them out on the market. Um, this is a last resort thing. They do come with a lot of stomach side effects. Um, so it's not the first thing that we recommend. Um, and then also a mucolytic agent. Dr. Farrakh touched on this earlier, where he talked about um, a couple of ways to reduce mucus. Um, one of them was N-acetylcysteine that he mentioned. Um, and then I just want to touch on inhaler techniques. So we can have all these inhalers, but if we're using them incorrectly, then they're not effective. And incorrect inhaler technique leads to unnecessary increases in step up therapy. So as I showed you earlier, if you're having symptoms then the doctor is going to step you up. Um, so that might not be necessary if you had correct inhaler technique. Um, there's increased risk of side effects, there's increased cost, there's decreased quality of life. If you have increased, um, if, if you have incorrect inhaler technique, it can lead to missed time from work and activities. You can have an increased risk of exacerbations and poor control of your COPD. I want to just briefly touch on the inhaler technique for the COPD inhalers. Um, I just feel like this is really important. I'm going to go through it very fast. If you have any questions or concern about inhaler technique, please touch base with your doctor or healthcare provider um, or your pharmacist um, to have your technique checked. Uh, this is really important. Um, so again, I'm going to go through this really fast in the interest of time. So um, to start off with, I want to speak about the MDI with spacer. So meter dosed inhalers, we always recommend using them with spacers. So quickly, you want to shake it up and down 10 times. Um, put the canister or spacer um, in your mouth. Um, put the canister, sorry, put the MDI in the spacer in your mouth. Um, push down on the canister. Inhale slowly hold your breath for five to 10 seconds. If you have a hard time holding your breath for five to 10 seconds, you can breathe in and out from the spacer. Um, you can do the tidal volume technique, which is a different type of technique um, than the traditional uh, technique used with MDI and spacer. Some very common errors that we see um, are clients having a hard time depressing the canister, Clients are not waiting 30 seconds in between puffs. You have to shake and wait 30 seconds before you take your second puff um, of your inhaler. The canister needs to recharge and repressurize. Um, sometimes clients think that it's good that the spacer whistles um, and sometimes they inhale too fast. 
because of that, um, you don't want to inhale fast through the spacer. You want to inhale slow so that medication can make a 90 degree turn down and get into the lungs. Um, lack of coordination between inhalation and pushing down on the canister is another common error that I encounter. Um, also, we need to be careful and we want to make sure our tongue is not covering or blocking the mouthpiece. Um, you don't sometimes clients forget to remove the dust cap. So they put the, sp uh, put the MDI into the spacer with the cap on. So the medication is just being sprayed into the cap, not into the spacer. And then another really common error that I see is using a spacer with a full face mask. So if you can seal your lips around a mouthpiece, then um, that is what we want you to use. Using a full face mask, um, allows more medication to be wasted. Um, medication can go under your face and then it can also be wasted in as you inhale through your nose. So always recommend a chamber with a mouthpiece. And then we also just recommend a chamber in general, like I mentioned earlier, with meter dosed inhalers, even for your reliever inhaler. The thing is, when you put an MDI straight into your mouth, it sprays so fast that the medication hits the back of your throat um and hits your tongue and a lot of that medication just sits in the mouth and throat and we don't get as much into the lung compared to when we use a chamber when we use a chamber we spray it into the chamber and then inhale slowly so that airflow can make that nice slow 90 degree turn down into the lungs this will allow for more medication to go into the lungs and less medication in the throat i know carrying a chamber can be quite cumbersome um they're big you Sometimes people don't want to use this with their reliever inhaler. Um, if you find that is the case, there are little arrow chambers to go where it's like a storing and a, a carrying case where you can store your meter dose inhaler and um, use it as a chamber. And they're really small. Um, so that's something that helps um, if, if using a chamber is a concern. Um, and then I just want to quickly touch on the Lipta device. So with the Lipta device, you want to slide the lid down until you hear a click, um, exhale away, take a steady and deep breath in, hold your breath for 10 seconds, and then exhale away from the inhaler. Common errors for this are inhaling too fast for, from the Lipta, that can cause the medication to go into the mouth and throat, or inhaling too slow where the medication um, is not being able to come up into the lungs. Um, this inhaler is breath actuated. So it's using your breath to get the medication into the lungs. We need to be careful. We don't want to block the vents with our fingers. We don't want to blow out into the device. Sometimes clients don't slide the lid all the way down till it clicks. Oh, my slides are changing. And shaking the device after the dose is loaded is also another error. And then there is the RespiMat device. So the RespiMat device, we use the acronym TOP. Turn, open, press. So turn the device till you hear a click, open the cap, exhale away, push the button for the RespiMat and inhale at the same time. Hold your breath for 10 seconds and then exhale away. Some common errors that I see with this device is that clients are not able to turn the device or push the button. Um, sometimes clients have difficulty coordinating their breath in while they push the button at the same time. Some clients forget to prime or don't know how to install the cartridge. Um, and then also coughing when um, you're doing uh, the inhalation, that can cause that mist to come out of the mouth. So you wanna make sure that you're taking a slow breath in from the rest of the mat so it can slowly go into your lungs. If you breathe in really fast, that can trigger a cough and coughing can cause a mist to come out. Then there is the turbohaler device. So the turbohaler device, um, you want to remove the cap, turn the base one way and back, um, exhale away, inhale fast and deep, hold your breath for 10 seconds, and then exhale away. Um, some common errors I see with this inhaler is turning the device um, just only one way, not turning it back, sometimes blowing out or or spitting or exhaling into the device that can cause um, the powder to clump up. 
turning the base too many times is another common mistake that we see. And then also inhaling too slowly. So the most common error I see with the turbohaler device is inhaling too slow from the turbohaler. This is really important in COPD because with COPD, um, it can be harder to take a really fast breath in um, with this type of condition. So make sure you have a strong enough breath in to get your medication from the turbohaler device. Then there is the breeze haler device. So this is a device where you remove the lid, you put a capsule you into the device, you inhale it, um, you want to inhale deep and steady and hold your breath for 10 seconds. Some common errors that we see are not piercing the capsule, you have to poke a hole into it, sometimes piercing the capsule too many times, um, not inhaling fast enough to hear a rattle blowing out or spitting into the device or swallowing the capsule. So these are all the common errors that you want to try to avoid with this inhaler. Then there is a genuary device. Um, you want to remove the cap, push the button in the back, um, inhale deep and steady, hold your breath for 10 seconds and then exhale away. Some common errors with this are not pushing the button in the back, not inhaling with enough force, or blowing out into the device. Then lastly, there is the inhab and discus device. These two devices are very similar in the way that they work. You have to slide open a lid, then slide down a lever, exhale away, inhale deep um, and steady, hold your breath for 10 seconds, and then exhale away. Some common errors with this are inhaling too slow, blocking the vents with your fingers, blowing out into the device, not sliding the lever down all the way and shaking the device after it's loaded. So don't shake. So that summarizes um, the pharmacological treatments for COPD. And now I just wanna touch on the non-pharmacological treatments for COPD. So what else can you do? Um, there are a lot of other things you can do for COPD. So Dr. Farah touched on this, vaccines. Vaccines are very important. Um, and I'll talk about that in the coming slides. Healthy diet, airway clearance, oxygen, pulmonary rehab, exercise, breathing techniques, and smoking cessation. So vaccines, vaccines prevent and reduce COPD flare-ups. They are important. Um, a common cause as to why we see COPD clients with a flare-up in the hospital is because they have a flare-up from an infection. Um, vaccines are proven um, and show that they reduce infections. Um, so there's four vaccine, so there's four types of infections that we want to try to prevent because there's vaccines out there for them. So one of them is the flu. The flu shot is available. If you have not gotten it yet, I really recommend and urge you to go get the flu shot. Um, it's available at um, most pharmacies. Um, I think all the bigger ones like Shoppers Drug Mart and London Drugs, they have them. Um, so yeah, go to your pharmacy and get the flu shot, COVID vaccine. Um, I think everyone should have gotten a booster um, by now for this season. Um, there was text messages that came out um, in the last like month or two for uh, the COVID booster. So um, if you haven't gotten a booster yet in the, in the last couple few months, then um, I would recommend following up with your uh, healthcare provider um, to discuss that. Um, pneumonia. So there's a few different pneumonia vaccines out there. There um, is Prevnar and there's the Pneumovax. Um, so talk to your doctor about that too. It's best that you go through your doctor um, because then they can keep a record of it um, on file. And then Dr. Farrell also touched on RSV. So now, recently in the last couple months, um, a new vaccine has come out for RSV. Um, very important that you get this vaccine. Right now, it's not covered by the government. It's a little over $200. Um, 
it's available for those over 60. If you're under 60 um, and have um, a, a chronic health condition like COPD, then you just need a prescription from your family doctor and you can take that to um, the pharmacy and you can access the RSV vaccine. So, and then healthy diet and weight. So I'm just going to briefly touch on this as well. Um, so ideal body mass index is between the ranges of 18.5 to 25. You can calculate your BMI online. Um, you'll just need your height and weight um, and that you can, you can get that from your doctor's office the next time you go in person um, if you don't have a scale at home. Um, and then you can also track uh, and, and uh, find out how much your caloric intake should be per day if you're curious and want to know about that as well. Um, and if you find out or realize that your BMI is not in that healthy range, then I would really suggest working with your doctor and dietitian to get you in that healthy range. Um, and then there's a few reasons why. So if you have a BMI higher than 30, um, then yeah, you could be overweight and being overweight makes it harder for the chest to expand. It can cause problems with gas exchange and it increases shortness of breath on exertion. Um, also with being overweight, there can be more fat deposition in the upper airway. So like in the throat, um, in the neck uh, in, in, and so on. And that can lead to more uh, chances of having sleep apnea um, or sleep disordered breathing. And then I also just wanna mention that being underweight is also an issue as well. So if your BMI is less than 18.5, um, then there's a higher risk of death for COPD. Um, there was a study that I saw and it showed that your risk of death goes up by 3.2%, I'm sorry, it's 3.2% higher than um, somebody who doesn't have COPD, um, or sorry, who has COPD is in, and is in the healthy range. And then being underweight is just associated with low muscle mask and low muscle tone. So really important to, to work with a dietitian um, in both of these situations, um, because then maybe they can help put you on a healthy eating plan and get you back into that um, ideal uh, BMI range. And then I also just want to recognize that BMI is not the end all be all. Um, if a person has a lot of muscle, um, their BMI can be higher um, because muscle weighs more than fat. Um, but these typically tend to be more like athletic people. Um, so yeah, just want to mention that as well. So now I'll just move on to airway clearance devices. So these are really important um, and to learn about if you have COPD. So there's a couple of positive expiratory pressure devices out there. There's the Robica and then there's the Acapella. I recommend the Robica because it's the easiest to access and it's easier to clean compared to the Acapella. Um, and yeah, it's it's in that eighty to one hundred dollar range. So the these devices they help reduce flare ups. They open up the small airways. They help clear mucus from the lung. They reduce shortness of breath and they improve performance of daily living. They're used at least once a day. You can use them actually up to four times a day if you like, um, for about ten minutes. It's very important though that you follow the instructions closely or see um, an expert on these devices to make sure you have correct technique. I see a lot of clients have in incorrect technique with these devices and then they're not working effectively or they're not working at all. Um, so it's very important that if you're going to use it, you use it correctly. Um, there is a really good YouTube video on the Robica device technique. Um, if you're curious and just want to learn a little bit more about it. Um, so, yeah. And then I'm just going to touch on supplemental oxygen. So supplemental oxygen only helps if you have hypoxemia. So if your saturations are less than 88%. Um, 
In the hospital, we target saturations between 88 to 92 percent with COPD. We don't want 100 percent, and I'll explain why. Um, you can measure your SpO2 or saturation on a pulse oximeter. Um, you can buy these from um, a lot of like the bigger pharmacies or medical equipment stores. You don't need one. Um, I would only suggest buying one if you uh, have COPD and have home oxygen and you just want to just keep track of it. Um, it's, it's, it's good to check if you're in a flare up, but I wouldn't suggest it being a daily or regular thing. And if you have no problems with your oxygenation, then you do not need one. Um, pulse oximeters work best when you are at rest, when your hand is warm and well perfused, it has good circulation. And also if you don't have artificial nails, artificial nails can block the reading. Um, once you put this oxygen saturation on, you need to wait at least 30 seconds. The first few readings you get are not accurate. Um, just wait 30 seconds to about a minute. Um, and then once you have a stable reading, a number that is stable and it's not going up and down, then that is what your pulse, um, what your saturation would be at that time. Um, and then just want to mention that oxygen is a drug. You must use it as prescribed. Do not go up and down on it. If you have been prescribed it for only for walking, don't use it when you're sitting. Um, so yeah, and the reason why is because if you have too much oxygen, so say if you don't need oxygen um, at rest and you use it at rest, it can cause your drive to breathe to go down because um, you're getting all this oxygen and your body thinks, oh, great, you're you're breathing a lot. Then it does it, but it's not actually clearing out carbon dioxide. And then this can lead to drowsiness, respiratory acidosis, and even death. So really important that you use it as prescribed um, and not um, using oxygen uh, uh, whenever you feel like it or, or so on. So and then also the other thing about supplemental oxygen is that it can dry out the nose. Um, you do not want to use any Vaseline or any oil-based products. It's a safety risk um, with oxygen and any like oil or Vaseline-based products. There's a higher risk of um, burns. And then you want, if you want to use something to hydrate your nose, um, you can use a Q-tip and then put um, a water-based lubricant like Sakaris or KY Jelly. These are water-based. Um, also a saline nose spray that can help. You don't need a prescription for that. And then ask your oxygen vendor about a mask. Um, if your flows are high enough, then maybe you can do a mask. Um, there are some masks out there that also have big holes in them. So just connect with them um, about what you can do if you're having very dry nose with oxygen. And then also staying, staying hydrated. If you're dehydrated, you're more likely to have dry nose compared to if you're well hydrated. So the home oxygen program, Dr. Farah also kind of touched on this as well. Uh, the home oxygen program is a program funded by the Ministry of Health. Um, if your oxygen levels are less than 88% while you're sitting at rest um, for greater than six minutes, uh, then you can qualify for a home oxygen concentrator, which is up at the right. To qualify for cylinders, um, which would be for like um, walking or, or oxygen for when you walk, then um, this is the criteria here below. So to qualify for 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 resting oxygen, um, or sorry, a walking oxygen, then you need to walk um, and have your saturations drop below eighty eight percent for greater than one minute. Then you have to walk again and show that you can walk 25% further and 30, me 30 meters further with oxygen. Or if when you're walking, um, if your oxygen drops below 80% on room air, then you can also qualify for cylinders that way. Um, 
liquid oxygen is no longer available in the home due to safety concerns. It was available before, but not anymore. And then there's private pay home oxygen. Um, so home oxygen can be privately paid for outside of the home oxygen program. Um, so you can get it covered through insurance sometimes with a prescription. Um, again, it's a drug, so use it appropriately. Um, with portable, there's portable oxygen concentrators out there. So I have a couple different ones here below. And these portable oxygen concentrators are available, but they're private pay only or available through extended health insurance. Um, so these machines make oxygen, they suck in air and then they separate out um, the air from, from the oxygen and then they can give you pure oxygen through the nasal prongs. Um, so yeah, these are available through private pay. And then I also want to touch on smoking cessation. So smoking cessation, um, very important with COPD. The thing is, if you smoke and if you have COPD, your COPD will progress faster than if you quit. So very important to um, quit if, if you are smoking um, with or without COPD. So with uh we have the quit now program here in bc they're great um you can get telephone support you can call this number um it's it's available they have a really good website as well um if you want to look up information um a lot of really good smoking cessation resources through bc quit now at vgh we have a drop-in smoking cessation clinic once a week it's wednesdays at 3 30 to 4 30 um here in the diamond center building um it, it's it's group um so um yeah and, and it's it's nicer snacks and juice as well here um if you come and then there's also you also want to work with your doctor and healthcare team and then just want to mention that there are quit medications that can help you quit um, so you can do it. Uh, you just have to 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 um, really be motivated, and 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 you might need some help along the way. So yeah. And then just to summarize, you want to work with your healthcare team to make sure you're on the best treatment for your COPD. If you think you have incorrect inhaler technique, then connect with your COPD educator, doctor, or pharmacist. I should mention everyone with COPD should see an educator at some point. Um, it's it's uh, part of our guidelines and we recommend that everyone with COPD have COPD education at least once. Um, and then also consider non-pharmacological treatment options like vaccines, diet, airway clearance devices, exercise, smoking cessation, breathing techniques, um, and then oxygen is a drug. So use it as prescribed and recommended by your healthcare providers. Um, so yeah, now I'll leave it open to questions. Thank you for that very comprehensive uh, presentation, Sonia. It was really quite fantastic. Um, Again, if there are questions, drop them into that question and answer box. We do have a few of them uh, in there. So let's get right to them with our couple minutes that we have. Uh, thank you, Jane, for your question uh, around flare-ups. Uh, how do you recognize a flare-up and what does that mean, Sonia? Yeah, so a flare-up would be a change in your COPD um, in the last 48 hours. So increased um, shortness of breath, chest tightness, wheezing, cough, or mucus. So a change in any one of these in the last 48 hours would be considered a COPD flare-up. That's a really good framing for what a flare-up would be. Uh, our next question really comes from Patricia, uh, who has who asks a question that's a little bit outside of the box, but not really. It's uh, She is asking about hyperbaric oxygen therapy and its support of COPD. Um, she suggested there are many people with long COVID uh, who are doing this because uh, there were a few case studies around that. Uh, do you know anything about clinical trials that may be happening for hyperbaric oxygen therapy with relation to COPD? Or what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, um, so there's nothing that I know about that's going on here um, at BGH. Um, right now, it's not 
recommended by the COPD um, thoracic society or the Canadian thoracic society guidelines on COPD, um, or we have like the gold guidelines, which are like the world guidelines for COPD. So it's not recommended. There's um, no studies that they've found that they thought were showing that there was an improvement in COPD with hyperbaric chambers. Um, the thing is here, we do have a hyperbaric chamber here at VGH. We wouldn't, we wouldn't use it for COPD. Um, and then there are private pay hyperbaric chambers that I've heard about. Um, but again, I don't know if it's worth spending your money on doing something like that, given that there's no um, guidelines or recommendations around that. So, yeah. Good. Um, and maybe just in summary of this part here, you did spend a good portion of your presentation uh, talking about the, the different treatments, of course, uh, and particularly around LABA and LAMA uh, and the, versus the steroid. And I don't want to pit them against each other, but maybe just summarize again for us. What are your thoughts around uh, one uh, versus the other? Yeah. So um, always for COPD, always recommend bronchodilators first. And then inhaled corticosteroids are recommended at the end. So it's the it's what we recommend after um, somebody has been on two different types of bronchodilators, then we'll add that in. Um, and usually it's added in for people who have been having flare-ups or are symptomatic despite um, two bronchodilators. Um, so again, with COPD, recommend bronchodilators first. It's fantastic advice. And I know there was a question in the chat uh, suggesting that they had uh, analysis paralysis, which uh, I assure you is very common amongst many, many other patients. Uh, and of course, we would always suggest that you consult with your trusted and your own medical professional as you make those decisions. Uh, but thank you for that, Sonia. I know that we have some few other questions as well, but we will hopefully, if we have time, uh, be able to answer all of those at the end of the next presentation, uh, which of course is going to be a, a two-headed uh, beast. And I mean that in the nicest possible way uh, to our friends from uh, from Poplar. So uh, of course, I'm gonna introduce you to Jenna. Jenna is a registered respiratory therapist and certified respiratory and tobacco educator. Jenna has worked for the Vancouver General Hospital for 15 years in various roles with a focus on respiratory education and pulmonary rehabilitation. With Jenna's commitment to personalized and preventative care, she has co-founded Poplar Pulmonary Wellness, an online respiratory care service that focuses on providing education, exercise, and community to those who live with chronic lung, lung conditions. She has done that with Tina. Uh, Tina who has over 17 years of experience as a registered respiratory therapist and is a certified respiratory educator. Uh, she was a clinical site coordinator for Thompson Rivers University for many years, educating RT students in their clinical years of study. Uh, she, of course, is one of the co-founders of Poplar Pulmonary Wellness. Uh, Tina, Tina currently proudly serves on the BC SRT Board of Directors as the Director of Education and she is currently the chair of the executive of the CSRT Primary Care Network. Jenna, Tina, take it away. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, there's been a lot of great uh, information presented and uh, we're gonna continue on on that trend as we talk about um, COPD and exercise. So moving to keep you grooving. And uh, so as Chris mentioned, Tina and I are respiratory therapists and certified respiratory educators. So along our theme, we've had perhaps a lot of uh, sitting and a lot of uh, listening and great question asking. So why not just take a moment to stretch it out a little bit? And I'm going to hand it over to Tina. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jenna. Um, and thank you very much to BC Lung Foundation for having us here today. Um, yeah, we know uh, two hours is a long time to uh, sit and listen. Um, so we'd like to just wake everybody up so that you'll pay attention to all the amazing things we're about to tell you. <laughs> um, so let's just um, take just a moment here to breathe and do some gentle, easy movement together. So we'll just take a moment here. Let's just start with some nice shoulder circles. 
as we just maybe breathe in as we bring our shoulders up to our ears and maybe breathing out as we bring our shoulders down. And we can think about this movement in four parts as we bring our shoulders forward and then up to the ears and then pinching our shoulder blades together at the back as we bring them down and then actively pushing our shoulders down. And we'll go the other way a couple of times, just focusing on nice breathing in and out with this movement. And then we'll move the arms now. So doing some nice big arm circles as we breathe. We want to make sure we're sitting up tall in our chair, feet are flat on the floor here, or maybe you're standing. If you can get up, please do so. And we'll just go the other way with our arm circles. Nice and gentle. You don't want to feel pinching in the shoulders here. Just a little bit of movement to get the breath flowing. Bring some oxygen to our bodies and our brains today <laughs> as we celebrate COPD Day. All right. And we'll do a little gentle spine twist. So we'll take one hand and put it to the opposite knee. We sit up tall and then maybe looking back just a little bit, a couple of nice breaths here. If you find it hard to breathe, just back off a little bit. Nice big breaths in and out. And we'll come back to center. And we'll take the other hand to the opposite knee as we sit up tall and then looking towards the back behind us as we take a nice couple of breaths here. Feel that twist in the spine kind of wakes up the digestive system doing this. Nice couple breaths in and out. And we'll come back to center. And we'll take three nice big breaths in and out together. We'll try to breathe in through our nose. And then when you breathe out, you can breathe out through pursed lips. So you make a nice little a hole with your lips like you're blowing out a candle and so we exhale fully fully and exhale for longer than we breathe in so we'll take a big big nice big breath in through our nose as we reach our hands up and then exhale through those pursed lips like you're blowing out a little candle in front of you nice and slow get it all that trapped air out and two more breaths just like this. Big breath in through the nose. Biggest breath in you've taken all day. And then out through pursed lips. Nice and slow. Take that time to get all that air out. And last one together. Big, big breath in. Big, 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 big in. And out through those pursed lips. Exhale all that bad stuff. Just let something go. All right, thank you very much. We'll get started with our talk here. And our talk is about moving and breathing. <laughs> Thanks for entertaining me All with that. All right, <laughs> Thanks for participating, everyone. We hope you just got a little movement in your body as we um, refocus and let's talk about exercise and COPD. Um, so Tina and I, we're founders of Poplar Pulmonary Wellness, and we, in our conflict of interest and bias page, we just wanted to highlight that we do offer uh, pulmonary rehab through our services. So the way that we're, and we're going to be talking about that in today's presentation, pulmonary rehab in general, and presenting some evidence. Um, so the way that we're going to mitigate that bias is really put the focus on the evidence-based data in terms of exercise and pulmonary rehab. And when we talk about services um, that are available in BC, we're going to offer, offer a balanced view of programs um, that we know about in BC. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about how to access it. So our objectives today, we're going to identify the positive health impacts um, of exercise uh, on the body. We're going to describe how exercise can improve um, COPD symptoms. We're gonna explain, as I mentioned, how to access pulmonary rehab programs uh, here in British Columbia. And we're gonna discuss some practical tips for getting started um, with an exercise plan. 
So we often hear a lot as educators, perhaps when you first get your diagnosis or even as perhaps the severity of your lung condition progresses, there may come a point where, where you may question, is exercise safe when I have COPD? And for the most part, the, resound oops, the resounding answer is yes. Uh, yes, it is safe um, and it's needed. And we're gonna walk you through why that is. Um, the World COPD Day has a theme and a the theme this year is acting early, so early for diagnosis. And we would say incorporating exercise as early as possible um, overall is, is gonna be a key, um, a key thing to take away from this top topic. There's just a small caveat if you have had a recent um, heart attack or uh, uncontrolled blood pressure. These would be things to talk to your doctor about before starting an exercise plan. Uh, but for, for most people, you're quite safe um, to exercise. So what does the research uh, tell us about exercise? And so another key um, message we wanted you to take away from this presentation is just this idea that moving is better than not moving. No matter where you are in the severity of COPD, whether early on mild symptoms first diagnosed or whether you might be um, at end stage um, lung disease, moving in some capacity is always gonna be better than staying sedentary. And so the comic kind of shows that this deck um, to prevent injuries, it's important to warm up before a workout. And then it says, oh, and if you, you can stay really warm, uh, you can prevent working out also. And that sort of plays in as we head into the winter season and our days are a little bit shorter. Um, you know, our bed may, and those uh, warm areas may call to us a little bit. Um, but just remember to incorporate some movement um, into your day. And we're going to talk you through how to do that in just a little bit. So what happens if we don't exercise? Well, if we don't exercise, um, and this is not just for COPD, this is just in terms of our overall health and well-being, we can really increase the prevalence of chronic conditions. Things like cardiovascular disease, like heart attacks and strokes, high, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. We can increase the prevalence of diabetes, of certain cancers like breast and colon cancer. We know we can increase the prevalence of anxiety and depression when we don't exercise obesity, and another big one, which is falls um, and fall-related injuries. We know exer not exercising can cause poor bone health, um, can cause poor cognition and memory loss, poor quality of life, and can increase our risk of mortality. So it really does impact every facet of our health and well-being. So what's the single best thing that we can do overall for our health? And that is, of course, exercise. It is a non-pharmacological treatment like um, Sonia talked about. It's low cost. And generally, all you need is about 30 minutes a day. And so the comic on this page is sort of showing this physician with a prescription pad saying, I'm, I'm prescribing you exercise. Um, think of it as a stress pill that takes 30 minutes to swallow. And that's exactly it. Exercise is absolutely medicine. So in the latest uh, CTS guidelines, uh, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit, um, it does talk about COPD in particular um, with exercise. And there have been some studies that showed that exercise uh, can reduce um, hospital admissions um, it can reduce your risk of mortality. It can improve your breathing symptoms like shortness of breath. And it can also improve um, mucus clearance. So the more you move, the more you get that mucus um, moving. And we've talked about some other non-pharmacological ways like the aerobica in terms of moving mucus. And it might be helpful um, in terms of um, mucus clearance and exercise to, um, you know, do your morning medication regimen, your inhalers. Um, perhaps you're doing that in combination with a mucus clearing device like an aerobica. And then that really clears your airways, opens them up to be able to head into your exercise class. 
So exercise, um, we can think about it as a biological need, much like sleeping or eating. And our Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines has a couple of really practical recommendations for us um, that we can incorporate into our day. And it uh, surrounds this idea of making our whole day matter. Um, so exercise is very planned and it's structured and it can be very uh, gradual. Um, but there's also the idea of physical activity, just movement. Um, and this is really important um, when we think of making our whole day matter. So there are a couple of recommendations uh, for age 65 and older um, around moving more. And so if you're in a category where you're feeling um, like you do have an exercise plan, you are able to get out for walks, maybe aiming for for this 150 minutes per week of um, cardio aerobic activity, maybe two times a week of muscle strengthening and training is something that speaks to you that you could work on. Um, but for some of you that might feel very intimidating and that's okay because we can focus on the physical movements. So we can focus on incorporating maybe a little more balance into your day, maybe doing some of your activities you normally do in a standing position instead of a sitting position. And this all will contribute to those positive effects of activity and exercise. The other thing we can kind of think about is reducing our sedentary time. And the recommendation is less than three hours of, of recreational screen time a day, um, as well as thinking about breaking up long periods of sitting like we just did uh, with our stretch before this talk um, and aiming for about eight hours or less of uh, sedentary time. Um, the next thing to think about in your day that can really help um, is sleep and trying to regularly get seven to eight hours of good quality sleep. And we hear from you that sleep is really an issue for many different reasons, um, but, but having an exercise routine or physical activity routine incorporated regularly into your day can help with your sleep. So in terms of exercise and COPD in particular, um, we know we hear from you that exercise is challenging and it's due to the symptoms that you experience because of your condition, such as shortness of breath and fatigue. And these symptoms can make your activities of daily living harder. Um, when you have COPD, some of the pathways as to why this feels harder is because you have a lot of, a, potentially a lot of obstruction in your airways. So your airways have narrowed. You're able to breathe the breath in, but it's harder to get that breath out. That may cause a lot of trapped air in the lungs, which we call, which we call hyperinflation. Um, as a result as well, you may not be exchanging your oxygen and carbon dioxide as efficiently, or you may have been diagnosed with low oxygen and you may be on supplemental oxygen to replace that. The less you do, the weaker your muscles get, unfortunately, and that can lead to a lot of deconditioning. And then of course, if you're doing less, um, you may be doing less socially as well, and this can contribute to anxiety and depression. Um, and so all of this plays in together to impact um, your exercise plan and how you move and your physical activity. And unfortunately, it can lead to a lot of negative lifestyle changes. One way we can break up that cycle is with exercise, and in particular with a pulmonary rehab program, which we'll talk to you about in just a little bit. So we know this, this positive lifestyle cycle is a cycle we see a lot when we teach pulmonary rehab. It's been around for a while, but it just really rings true in that when you're diagnosed with a lung uh, condition on step number one, um, this can affect your activity. So because of the shortness of breath and fatigue, um, and so if we uh, introduce in step number three, exercise, and we do some retraining of our breathing pathways in a supervised way um, with some monitoring, with learning breathing techniques, we know we can decrease the sensation of shortness of breath people feel. 
And once we decrease that sensation or you feel a bit more, more in control of your breath, you can reduce anxiety and bump up your confidence. And this is really important in um, recognizing what your coping skills are and what you can use in different situations. And so when you're feeling confident, when you feel like you have coping strategies that work for you, when you feel in control of your breath, then you're able to do more. When you're able to do more, you're able to get out more and um, reattend some of your social activities. And all of this can really boost your self-esteem. So this is what we aim to do with exercise and pulmonary rehab. All right, so we know that now we need to move, our bodies need it. Um, and there are so many different ways to incorporate this into our life. Um, and there are different types of exercise. So I'm gonna talk about the different types of exercise and maybe how we can find ways to find exercise and activity that works for each of us. So there are three main areas and uh, I'm gonna expand on each of these points. So one of them is uh, endurance or aerobic activities. And these are activities that we can do for a little, little while because they're at a level that we can do for a little while. And that'll look different for everybody. There are strengthening exercises or resistance exercises that are designed to build muscle. And then we have flexibility and balance exercises. These are great, especially as we age and we are at risk of falling and getting injured. So if we can practice flexibility and balance every day, um, that'll help us work towards having greater health and reducing the risk. So let's uh, talk about endurance or aerobic activities. And so the um, Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines is suggesting that we do 150 minutes every week of moderate to vigorous activity. And so you might be thinking, well, I have COPD and there's no way I can do that type of thing that long every week. And the way that the guideline is, it will look very different to each person. And so what might be moderate or vigorous to somebody who's young and healthy um, is way too much for somebody who's older and who has COPD. And so for you, vigorous might be walking, you know, so you've got to find an exercise um, or an activity that you can do comfortably for a while that does involve movement. And there's a picture here of somebody, you know, gardening. And so what we want to do is find ways to incorporate activity into our lives in a way that brings us pleasure and joy so that we want to keep on doing these things. And so it's nice to think about um, what you like to do and find a way to incorporate that into your life. And as we see here on this slide, you would not do giant bouts of activity here. We just break it down into little manageable chunks. And so if we think about doing three 10 minute sessions a day, that might be something you could, you could bite off and chew and maybe work towards. So if your current fitness level doesn't let you do that, that's okay. These are the goals. And so it's something to work towards. Um, go next slide strength training. So when we think of strength training, you might be thinking about dumbbells and weights, <laughs> um, but that might not appeal to everybody. Um, there are also uh, exercise bands. Personally, I think these are a little more fun and a little more inviting, but you don't even need equipment. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is yoga, and you don't need any equipment to do yoga. Um, we also have our own bodies and they're heavy. <laughs> so we come with our own built-in weight. And there are a lot of um, exercises that you can do um, without any extra weights as well. So that makes it more affordable um, as well. And when you're building strength, you wanna start slow and you wanna focus on correct technique um, and then you progress. So if you're doing some movement, like maybe a bicep curl where you bring your palms to your shoulders, maybe you hold a weight or a band, um, you want to start with about eight to 12 times with a lighter weight that's totally manageable and get some guidance, get somebody to show you 
um, how to do it properly and safely so you don't hurt your joints or your back or anything like that. So especially with tra strength training, I would suggest that this is a good um, a good thing to get help on when you start doing a program and do talk to your physician before you start doing uh, any uh, strength training um, exercises. And we do recommend doing strength training two to three times a week. And you want to space it out so that your muscles get a chance to recover between these um, bouts of exertion. And then the last type of exercise is flexibility and balance. Flexibility and balance is a great place to start um, because you can do this every day. It's not super exertional. Um, but it, it does get you moving. It does get the breath flowing a little bit. Um, and I find that starting slow is the best way with any exercise routine so that it's something you feel is maintainable. And I know that when I do finally start moving, like doing a stretch or balance exercise, it makes me feel like, hey, maybe I can do more. Like maybe I will pick up a weight or something. So it's a good little uh, gateway movement. Um, so stretching um, we do recommend doing it two to three times a week, but you can do it every day. Um, and you just want to stretch until you feel a gentle pull. And the point is to return the muscle to its um, nice full length so that you get um, continued range of motion. And you want to hold a stretch for uh, 30 seconds to one minute. And then balance exercises. These are great for falls prevention. They're also good for strengthening the core muscles. And the core muscles are the real important ones. You wanna have a strong core before you start doing any heavy weight training or anything like that. So core is a great place to start and doing simple balance exercises like standing um, beside a wall or a chair for balance and just maybe standing with both of your feet glued together and maybe just stand up tall and don't move for 30 seconds, you know, and that's a great way to start. And there are ways to progress this. So maybe one day you end up standing on only one foot and you just hover your hand over the chair and not touching it. You know, that would be something to work towards. And it's a nice goal because setting goals that are achievable encourage us to keep going because then we notice that we're progressing and that doing the exercise is actually giving us benefit. Uh, next slide. So we know that exercising is wonderful for us. Everybody needs to do it. Jenna gave a full list of um, problems and complications that can happen when we don't move enough. But when we do move enough, or even when we just start moving more than we normally do, we get all of the benefits. And so there are barriers um, that are extrinsic to us, um, like costs, gym fees, transportation and weather. And then there are intrinsic barriers that we do have control over, um, like not having enough time in the week, um, feeling too shortness of breath, which we know we can stay, take steps and help towards correcting that. And then just not being sure of what you're doing or if you haven't um, done exercise in a long time, you really should want to seek out some, some advice. And so we could just take a moment to think about what barriers are holding you back from exercising and finding ways just one by one to knock out those intrinsic barriers so that you do start to move. And one good way to start moving is through a pulmonary rehabilitation program. And Jenna's going to talk to us about that. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. So Tina went through some um, some nice progressions, some nice exercise um, goals and, and what it looks like for exer an exercise prescription, the different types of exercises. Um, so who can help you uh, with this plan at any stage that you're at? Um, and there's a lot of resources out there. So you might have a pulmonary rehab program through your local hospital or community um, these programs are, since the pandemic, a mix of in-person or virtual, so they're a little bit more accessible now for those, especially in small communities who don't have access to in, um, a local or in-person program. 
Um, once you get started out on a plan, we know that continuing on an exercise plan and continuing all the positive things you learn in a pulmonary rehab program are only maintained if you continue to maintain uh, the self-management and the exercise. And so there are maintenance programs out there like Breathe Right with the DC Lung Foundation, which is a free program and there's more information on their website. Maybe it appeals to you to work a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, especially if you haven't um, done an exercise program before, perhaps working with a local uh, physiotherapist or physiologist one-to-one -to, -one to come up with a plan um, is something that might work for you. Maybe you like to do things socially, um, and so you might look to your local community center or YMCA to see what programs they have that you might feel comfortable um, being involved with. Um, we heard a little bit earlier, I think from Dr. Farah, about walking, uh, just getting out for a walk is a low cost way, maybe to keep us motivated and continue on with that goal. Maybe you're walking with a friend or a walking group. Um, and there are definitely walking groups um, in, uh, in local communities. And then there are um, online pulmonary rehab programs. So as a topic of pulmonary wellness, we have one. And there are other programs available as well, like iMaster Health or Wilkin. And uh, Exibol is a new program. And there's more information on Exibol for COPD on the BC Lung website. So what are pulmonary rehab programs? So these are comprehensive, tailored programs for those living with chronic lung conditions like COPD. They all look a little bit different, um, but they generally follow a structure to be able to call themselves a pulmonary rehab program. Um, so they're between eight to 12 weeks long. Uh, some programs include a maintenance program as well. So there's an initial part of the program where you start very gently um, in terms of uh, learning new tools and education, as well as just starting exercise then the exercise continues on in a gradual manner. And then after you do the initial program, you can maintain the exercise and the self-management with maintenance programs. Um, we work on a lot of behavior change. So we work on a lot of goal setting. Um, you know, what are things that you can't do now that you feel like you want to be able to do? What are the steps to get there? Um, we know that pulmonary rehab programs not only improve your exercise capacity, so your physical well-being, but it also improves your psychological well-being as well. And it promotes just um, these long-term adherence to healthy living strategies, things like improving sleep, improving nutrition. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to attending a PR program and there's a lot of research behind it as well. So research tells us two main things that pulmonary rehab programs can improve your exercise capacity. So this means your ability to do your activities of daily living, your ability to make your bed or hold your groceries or go for a walk. It can improve your shortness of breath and your fatigue. And I mentioned already, a lot of this is to do with physical conditioning, but also some uh, breathing retraining. It improves your muscles, helps to keep them strong and use oxygen more efficiently. We work on balance, reducing risks for falls and the complications that might come from a fall. And it can reduce hospitalizations as well. Pulmonary rehab also increases your quality of life. So it, it improves your mood. It can reduce anxiety and depression. We talked about already, it can improve your sleep. It can improve your independence and improve social isolation. So what can you expect from a program? Um, so teasing out the two components and the exercise component, you can expect to exercise at least two times per week. Um, the exercise is often supervised um, and is a combination of strength and aerobic type exercises. It progresses over time. So you start where you are in that, that moment, whatever that looks like for you, and your facilitator will work with you to progress that uh, week by week. There's some monitoring involved, usually looking at heart rate and oxygen saturation, potentially blood pressure, and um, learning tools to manage and gauge what your shortness of breath is like. And at the end, you usually get an exercise prescription or a plan to move forward with. 
the education components. So in pulmonary rehab, we do a lot of individual assessments. So how are you feeling in terms of um, your quality of life? There's a lot of goal setting that's done. It's taught by the experts, the professionals, certified respiratory educators, respiratory therapists, potentially physios um, or occupational uh, therapists or registered dietitians. It all depends on the program. And relevant topics to learn healthy living strategy tools are addressed. So little tips and tricks to help you with your everyday. Um, pulmonary rehab fosters connection. And this is so important. And this is just a group shot of our pulmonary rehab program that, um, that we ran in the spring. Um, so people connect. They meet each other, you get to know each other, you get to sort of, you're working on your own goals, but you're working collectively. Um, and so all of that can really help you stay motivated, can help you keep on your plan. And even when pulmonary rehab is over, a lot of these people choose to stay connected with each other. So it is a really great way to reduce things like anxiety, depression, and social isolation. So really seek out, ask for pulmonary rehab, talk to your healthcare professionals about it. Um, because participants come out of, come out of doing a program and, uh, and they wondered why they didn't have this earlier or start it earlier. And that is another key message to really do this as early in your diagnosis as possible. So how can you access these programs? So like I said, talk to your healthcare professionals, um, seek out what's online. The BC Lung Foundation website uh, lists programs and has a lot of great exercise resources. You really, really wanna do this early on in your diagnosis because you'll learn what you need early to keep motivated and to keep on plans and seek out online programs. So these programs really kind of stem from the pandemic. Um, we know that they're evidence-based um, tele-rehab programs and there are a couple options that are listed here. And before we finish off here, we'd like to leave you with, with a few tips, you know, towards um, optimizing your exercise session in hopes that um, it will be something that's more appealing, knowing that you can do it without um, feeling too short of breath. So you really want to start with something light and slow, and then very gradually uh, build up your intensity. You want to use warm ups and cool downs. This is so that your muscles have a chance um, to get the blood flowing and the oxygen in them before you um, put that demand upon them. Breathing, so breathing in through your nose and out through pursed lips can really help reduce the amount of trapped air and never hold your breath when you're doing an exertional activity. Um, you want to stretch and practice balance as often as you can. Daily is great. And using your inhalers, maybe even before activity, if they've been prescribed to you that way, um, and your oxygen as it's been prescribed. Use aids, use your walkers, use your walking sticks. If something can help you get out and active, do it. It's totally worth it. Don't worry about those social stigmas. <laughs> um, and then getting outside can be something that really pulls people in and um, draws them towards activity, but be aware that this might be a trigger and it can cause some shortness of breath. So do watch the air quality. Uh, you can check online to find out the air quality um, each day to see if maybe that is a good day or not a good day to do your outside activity. Um, and then setting goals. Um, you can use um, pedometers or um, monitors on your cell phone, and that's nice um, when you achieve them. It's positive reinforcement. You can be proud that you've achieved something, and you'll notice the benefits. And then the main thing is to choose something that you enjoy doing, something that's fun, that you'll want to do regularly, because exercise really only benefits you while you're still doing it regularly. If you did it once, by the end of the month, it doesn't help you anymore. So you've got to keep this up. Um, and in conclusion, our main, main message is exercise is medicine. With COBD, it's super important. It can help you reduce your shortness of breath and your fatigue. Pulmonary rehabilitations are out there. Seek them out um, and um, get support, set goals, and get your whole family involved to um, support you in doing these activities. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I think we've uh, run out of time. Do we have time for questions? <laughs>
I that was a absolutely outstanding presentation. So thank you to both of you for that. Um, yes, we're going to try to get through a couple. We have just a couple minutes to the top of the hour here. Um, and there were a lot of questions that came in. So the first thing I want to say is if you've got a question and you put it into the chat boxes, uh, we will be answering those and emailing those answers back out to you. So rest assured, if you have questions, you are not going to be alone and we will get to those. Uh, the biggest thing that I really want to get to, of course, is around this concept of exercise management. And I will make it very clear, as Tina just mentioned, get, getting your family involved. Everybody could probably use an exercise management plan just like this. Uh, so that's going to be very useful. Uh, one of the things that I uh, want to get out there that was asked is, what about the access to pulmonary rehab in itself? Uh, so we talked a lot about the benefits, but if you are someone online right now and says, hey, I want to get into that, what do you recommend for them? Yeah, there's so pulmonary rehabilitation uh, in BC is increasing. So with the pandemic, we saw um, some hospital programs move online. We know that there are wait lists, but you should still um, contact your local um, resources. So it could be in a community center, could be in a hospital, approach your GP, approach your respirologist about those. Um, but there are also online ones that you can get involved with. BC Lung has the Breathe Right classes. They've got resources on there. That's free. It's online. And then there are other companies out there as well. Exible, Wilkin, iMaster Health, and Poplar Pulmonary Wellness. We all offer um, online exercise. So it doesn't matter where you live. As long as you've got some internet, um, we can work with you. It's a really good answer. It's related to a question that Karen Martin asked as well is how do I find a COPD educator? Well, <laughs> in this chat room right now, uh, we've got a bunch and, and Tina just listed out a bunch of different ways to get involved and get in touch with them. Uh, but are you guys open to uh, people reaching out to you guys, of course, specifically saying, hey, I need some help from a COPD educator. How do they get in touch with you? Absolutely. So um, thanks, Chris. So the easiest way is uh, through our website, www.poplarpulmonary.com. Um, so we have all of our services to there as well as our email. Um, we're, we're very open. We're very new. Uh, so we're, we're building our community and kind of seeing um, what types of things people want to learn about. Um, we are on social media as well. And uh, BC Lung Foundation has the Asthma COPD Facebook group. Sometimes we pop in there and uh, answer questions or highlight different services that we have going on. Um, so there's definitely lots of ways to, to get in touch. And there was a question in there that um, it really is a bit of a devastating question that uh, they felt like their lungs were so damaged uh, that uh, they wouldn't really be able to work with a pulmonary function professional. Um, now, the, the truth of the matter is there's a lot of different options there. And um, thank you to some of the other uh, people in this room that have commented about things that have helped them. Um, namely, of course, the Breathe Right program that is on our website that has been mentioned several times. That is free. Uh, thank you to Jill for putting those together for us. And those are all accessible online uh, with an internet connection. Uh, the other one, of course, is Exible, which has also come up a few times. Thanks to generous donors to the BC Lung Foundation. Uh, we have been able to reserve spots that make that free and accessible to uh, COPD patients here in British Columbia. Uh, so you can go to the BC Lung website for information on how to sign up there for those things as well. And those are all different options that you can have uh, that will really help you. Um, there's a lot of different stuff out there. Uh, anybody that's still with us, uh, Tina, Jana, Sonia, uh, Dr. Farah, is there any parting words that you have before we close this up? Um, I think it's just what you what you said, Chris, just in the spirit of World COPD Day and other uh, message about acting early. So these healthy living strategies um, that we mentioned, pharmacological, non-pharmacological, um, really important to just get on the right treatment plan really early on. Work with the healthcare professionals that you have access to. Continue to advocate for yourself and ask your questions. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say reach out. There's a lot of resources, online support groups, you know, get in, get in with other people going through what you're going through. Um, when you're looking for medical advice, go to the professionals though. Um, so do discern where that information comes from, but there are supports out there for sure. Please reach out. We're happy to help. 
I also want to point out one of the most important steps you can take is attending things just like this. And I want to congratulate all of you who are online and joining us for this because you are taking the right steps and protecting yourself and getting the right information you need to make the decisions that you need for yourself. Uh, right down to the around the vaccines and, like, uh, like and and one of the things that I also want to point out is that um, I'm inviting everybody to join us for uh, a future workshop that we're going to have on RSV specifically. Uh, so that might be something of interest for a lot of you. You can find that information on our website. It will be happening a little bit later. Um, all in all, I want to say thank you. Congratulations again to everybody. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. This was absolutely fantastic with so much information being shared. I hope everybody feels like there is support available no matter where you are in your journey in COPD. Uh, and on World COPD Day, we are all thinking of you. We're all with you and we're all in this together. So everybody finds time to breathe easier today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.